All right, everybody, we're gonna go ahead and get rolling. Just real quick, just some nuggets of wisdom for you today dealing with compliance issues on guard contracts. What I'm trying to do is get you out of Karen jail, okay? Um, these are common problems that we see often with contracts. Um, not only are we trying to save you uh, heartache and, and trouble and difficulties after the contract is, is signed, but if you do this and you do it thoroughly and you submit offers that are 100% complete, 100% accurate, and don't contain any of some of the, the errors that we're gonna talk about, you have a higher probability of having your offer be accepted. I, can, I cannot tell you how many times I have submitted an offer and everything else has been equal, but the agent will provide feedback that the only reason they accepted our offer, it was pretty much equal monetarily on everything else, but just the professionalism of a, of a presented offer that is organized, that is neat, that is labeled correctly, that is initialed correctly, that has everything done, will make a difference to the listing agent if, they have, if they're worth their, worth, worth their salt. Okay, so we're gonna talk about just some general overarching things with GAR contracts that are compliance issues, and we're gonna look at some specific examples, okay? So first of all, just some general principles of GAR contract documents. Exhibits are always labeled A, B, C. Amendments are? One, two, three. One, two and three, thank you, okay? Um, you as an agent, what's your what's your philosophy on filling out um, disclosure documents my pen does not ever literally or figuratively touch a seller's property disclosure or a community association disclosure okay I absolutely will provide feedback to my client who is filling those things out um, and make sure that they are including everything that needs to be in there, but my pen doesn't touch it. Um, this day is gonna turn into a little bit of uh, storytelling, so I'll tell you some stories, okay? Uh, very good friend of mine, um, a, a gentleman that I considered a mentor when I first got into this industry, um, was driving his car, had a listing, the, um, the, they were under contract, the seller contacted him and said, you know what, we've changed our minds. Um, I think it wasn't, actually it wasn't under contract, it was before the contract. But they said, we've changed our minds, we've decided we're gonna take that refrigerator that's in the, in the uh, garage after all. Because they had put two, two refrigerators on the seller's property disclosure. And they said, hey, can you make that quick change real quick? He was driving, didn't do it, forgot about it, until the closing day, closing day came, they did the final walk and the, and the agent that was buying the home said, there's a missing refrigerator. Guess what my friend did? He, he bought him a new refrigerator that day. It was a $1,200 mistake, okay? Don't let that be you, okay? So likewise, your, your pen never changes it. Um, when you get it on an offer and you're writing an offer, you don't make any changes on that, on that disclosure document. You don't know and look at it and go, well, the, um, the HOA said that it's actually $250, not $225. It's not your job to go in there and make that change. And if you notice on any of the seller's property disclosure and community association disclosure, whose signatures are on there? The buyers, the buyers and the sellers. That's a document between them. Your signature's not on there. That's intentional, okay? Keep it that way, all right? So once that offer um, has been made, um, completion only of your side of the details of, uh, on things like the loan, uh, the lead-based paint exhibit, um, once an offer has, been, has had the binding agreement date entered, the only way to make changes, there's only two ways to make changes, and that is um, uh, through strike through and initials and then amendments, okay? So we're gonna talk about strike through and initials. We did this the other day, but I'm, I've got one more thing to talk about before we, we, we see some examples. Okay, this is actually in the purchase and sale agreement, and you need to know this, okay, because it's important. Rules for interpreting this agreement, I think this is paragraph uh, B4L. I don't think that's a one, I think it's an L. Um, in the event of internal conflicts or inconsistencies in this agreement, the following rules apply for how conflicts or inconsistencies shall be resolved um, and they will apply, okay? 
handwritten changes control over pre-printed or pre-typed um, provisions. Exhibits shall call, control over the main body of the agreement. So if you have the purchase and sale agreement saying one thing and the, and the conventional loan exhibit saying another, which one's gonna rule? The conventional loan exhibit, okay? Um, special stipulations shall control over both exhibits and the main body of the agreement. Okay, questions? This isn't, this, is, this isn't new, right? I hope not. This last one might be new because I don't think it uh, has always been this way, okay? Notwithstanding the above, any amendatory clause in an FHA or VA exhibit shall control over inconsistent or conflicting provisions contained in a special stipulation, another exhibit, or the main body of the agreement. It, basically, it's the, the FHA or VA amendatory clause is, I'll paraphrase, basically it says, regardless of what happens and anywhere else written in any provision, doesn't matter, this rules. Um, if the house doesn't appraise, the client can't be penalized. The, the buyer can't be penalized by forfeiture of their earnest money if it doesn't appraise and, they can't, and we can't come to an agreement on it, okay? That's why in this industry, in this time, this seller's market, conventional loans are gonna, are gonna win over an FHA or VA almost every day because this provision cannot be removed, all right? Now, having said that, so this, re, this, re, this applies to everybody's using appraisal gap coverage. Can an appraisal gap written special stip override an uh, a FHA or VA a mandatory clause? No. The answer is no. Okay? It, it's not that you can't make the payment, it's that they can't force you to make the payment, right? So if you, if you wanted to blur ethical lines a little bit, you could say, oh, a mandatory clause says we don't have to. L Lanier, you're, you're brilliant. <laughs> You just totally segued right into it. Thank you very much. So having said that, can, a, um, can an appraisal gap coverage special step be included in, in an FHA or VI offer? Yes. It can. You could have the option. You know, if it's only 2,500 bucks, most, most buyers would say, ah, I'll pony up, pony up the 2,500 bucks. But if it's $25,000, then you want to be able to exercise this clause that's written into the purchase and sale agreement right there, paragraph four down at the bottom. Okay, so you can, but it can't be enforced. All right. And unfortunately, um, keep this a secret, don't tell anybody, but not everybody's as smart and being educated on this in other brokerages. So your listing agent may not know that that appraisal gap coverage that you wrote the special tip for for an FHA offer doesn't really hold much weight, okay? So that can be a strategic advantage to you. Okay, most common problems uh, with GAR contracts when you're using the strike through and the, uh, and the initial is you're missing a set of initials somewhere along the line. And if you wanna get it kicked back, if you want to have a contract that is potentially voidable, you wanna make sure you got all the initials in there. Does this one look okay? Well, that's questionable. You're, you're absolutely right. So, so the set of initials down here is for the seller's initials. The fact that that proximity is so close, eh. Yeah. This one you're probably okay on. <laughs> Don't, don't overanalyze, okay? Let's look at some other examples. Just examples. <laughs> Just examples. All right, let's look at this one. What's this? Does anybody, does anybody recognize this one? This is the 
This is in the FHA exhibit. This is the FHA amendatory clause. So I didn't need to paraphrase it, it's right there. But this is a common issue and a common problem is, um, is that the, um, the, the sales price that goes in the amendatory clause if you're negotiating, you end up changing the price, it's, it's always incorrect. So in this case, somebody was smart, struck through, did the new amount. Um, one set of initials, what's that problem? Just the buyers and sellers. Yep, just the buyers and sellers. Okay, so you can see this when this stuff comes in. Go through it, do a quick quality check on it. Um, it's only going to save you the headache and the heartache later on. Um, you might as well get it done right the first time. All right, what about this one? Does this one look okay? Depends on who the signing people are on it, but I'm seeing two separate initials from two separate signing session, sessions. Notice that one is uh, um, Docs Plus, and this one probably is dot loop or somebody else's signing system, some proprietary system. So that one looks okay. What about this one? Does this one look okay? Maybe. Yeah, I think it is. But these are the common, most common problems that you're going to see. There's another example. Um, I would have liked to have seen those closer to over there. Sorry, didn't mean to do that closer to, to right there or maybe above, I don't know, but is it acceptable? Yeah, pretty much. But you said only if it's not a binding contract. If it's binding, you have to have an amendment. If it's binding, you don't go back and change a binding contract with strike through and initials, only while you're negotiating. After it's binding, it has to be an amendment. So could you also say strike through and initials with writing contract? Yes. Okay. Strongly recommend. Well, that's what I do. Well, I've never had this yeah. like clean offer. And stuff. Yeah, I've never had like resend a clean offer. Okay, so, okay. And I'll just send it for the fifth time. Yeah, it's it, it gets a little old after a while, but it, it's all doable. The other thing that you can do is if you do end up making a bunch of these changes, you can do what's called a conforming copy, which is after you've already bound it and you've got all of these kind of initials and questionable, you know, which one came first, it's easy to do a conforming copy of a binding contract. Um, and there's a, sp a special stip that you write in that says this is a conforming contract of, a, of the contract dated XYZ. Um, and it, it just cleans everything up, okay? All right, um, that's I think the last example. Um, let's talk, okay, here's one. This was on an amendment to address concerns. Missing some initials there, right? That's only one side. Yep. All right, the next biggest problem um, with guard contracts from a compliance standpoint is missing exhibits um, or mislabeled exhibits, okay? Has, I, I tend to, I'm anal retentive, so I do the A, B, C, D, E, just in, in that order, but it doesn't matter. You could do it Z through X. It does, it, I agree. Um, whichever order you put it in, I strongly suggest you keep it in the same order. Um, literally, you know, you can drag and drop in your remind and put everything in the same order, which I'm a big fan of. It just, it just makes it sort easier when you go to download it. It's already in the right order. Just makes, makes perfect sense. Okay. Um, if you do put anything down there, make sure you put the exhibit um, label that you're, that you're putting on there, okay? Um, you are working with an, uh, a home, they have not posted the seller's property disclosure on the MLS, the agent has slowed, rolled you, sending it to you, what do you do? Yep, so you put it in there, and you label it, even though it's not included in your document, and there's a special step that's pre-written that says, sales property disclosure is not included, um, please provide it within usually three days, and then it gives you the out 
to say after review of it, the, my client has the ability to cancel the, the terminate the contract if it's not acceptable to them. Question. Yes, ma'am. Besides the lead-based paint exhibit, is there any other form that if you don't have it, you can get fined? Like the lead-based paint is the big one. If you do something that is negligent or misrepresent anything, Grec could, of course, um, fine you or or whatever. But it's got to be pretty egregious, to be honest with you. Okay. But the lead-based paint is definitely one, um, where is it there, that um, has EPA-regulated fines for you as an agent as well as for the brokerage. Um, does anybody know what those fines are? Uh, it's about 11,000 bucks, last time I checked. Pretty, pretty ugly. Don't mess up a lead-based paint. All right? No, no, there's not. Okay, um, everybody, you should know or be familiar with the receipt of this agreement is hereby acknowledged by either the buyer or seller. Where do you see this? You see it on buyer's, buyer's brokerage agreement and listing agreement, okay? Um, Docs Plus, I like, is very good about filling in this date whenever the last person signs the, the rest of the document, okay? Does anybody know why it's important to have that? Why? When it comes to like surgeries and stuff, to know when you start coming? Um, well, I guess not. If, if, they have, agreement. if they come with somebody else and there's this 3.36 right. p.m. on 4.14.2022? Yep. Okay. So how is it that Remind Docs Plus can fill this date in automatically? When, when the person e-signs the last session, it sends the notice back to say, you've re -signed, you've signed everything. Here's your copy for your files if you want it. That's how they can fill in that date. Let me give you a perfect example of why this is important. Um, and again, it's less of an issue now because Docs Plus does this for you. The only thing I'm, I'm telling you this is because if you happen to be filling out and printing off the paper, for the ex listing agreement or the buyer's brokerage agreement, having them sign it in person, it's important to fill in that date. Here's why. Um, I, this is previous brokerage, was working with another, uh, an, an agent. She signed an exclusive listing agreement for a lot up in Big Canoe. Everybody know where that's at? Big vacation community up in the mountains. Um, not a hotbed of activity. Um, it was a lot. And a week later, after signing it, after putting it on the MLS, after starting to market it, signs in the yard, the seller come, calls uh, my, my agent and says, come get your sign out of the yard, I sold it. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, hello? <laughs> um, and she had to explain to him after a, a lengthy conversation, um, we have an exclusive listing agreement which, um, which entitles me to, uh, you know, my brokerage to a commission regardless of who brings the buyer. Um, send me your, the contact information. He was like, no, no, I'm, I'm not, I, I got this under control. And he thought he could avoid the commission. Um, and she, he, he, she was like, well, you signed the, the, the listing agreement. He was like, I, you sent me a whole bunch of stuff. I don't know what I signed, and I don't know that I have a copy of any of it. Guess what? That was missing. Turned it over to an attorney to say, hey, can we go after him? And he was like, without that date there, it's not going to hold up in court. So she lost the commission. She didn't do anything, but she could have. Um, and b because she didn't fill in that date, and this was before um, Docs Plus, where it was, it was happening automatically, um, we lost out on that opportunity. That's why it's important. So that's true for both buyer's brokerage agreements as well as listing agreements. Okay. It could be, could be. So there's that one. This is one um, that I pulled out of out of my files, which I think I ended up having it signed later in person, and I'm sure I filled it out. But I just wanted to show you an example. This is actually for a seller. That one's for a buyer. But you get the idea. All right. Little nuggets of wisdom for you today. Any questions on anything? Well, if you
I can't imagine a scenario where you would forget to bind it because that's a pretty important thing, right? <laughs> um, so I got sidetracked. Tell me your question one more time. Probably not. Yeah, I would on the date that they signed it. Okay. I mean, yeah, just just make sure you're and 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 then in order to comply with the fact that they're acknowledging that they've received a copy, email them the copy, and then you've then you've 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 taken all question out of the out of the equation you've got an electronic version of them you providing them with the fully fully signed copy make sense question. what other question you had one linear yeah. you got it okay so Ami? i was just curious when you send a e-signature to a client to remind and they finish signing do they get a copy or are you they do back and they do they yep. do yep they get that too all right. Any other questions? Thank y'all.